Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play the entirety of this video and then I'll go back and talk about things that are going on and things that I think that were done right and or done wrong. Without further ado, here we go. Hello, I'm Captain Jason Ramos, Commander of the Sheriff's Office Professional Standards Division. We're here today to provide our community information regarding a critical incident which occurred in Sacramento County and involved Sheriff's Office personnel. Today, you will learn about different procedures the Sheriff's Office utilizes in order to investigate cases involving use of force, obtain and preserve relevant evidence, and evaluate each individual incident. Please keep in mind, the Sheriff's Office takes the use of force by any employee very seriously. We conduct thorough investigations to ensure that the actions taken by all personnel are within the procedural standards of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office and in compliance with state law. We are still in the early stages of this investigation and our understanding of the facts and circumstances may change as we review more evidence and interview additional witnesses. The information contained within this video is based on what we know right now. Please note, we do not draw any conclusions based solely upon this video as to whether or not our employee acted within policy or state law. Our conclusions, rather, are based on the totality of the evidence that we have gathered at the time the investigation has been completed. We hope the content of this video serves as an educational tool for our community to promote the development of understanding and transparency within the communities we serve. Hello, everyone. I'm Sergeant Tess Detterding, Public Information Officer for the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office. Today we're going to show you an overview of an incident which occurred in the town of Harold in the county of Sacramento on October 6, 2019. You will hear some of the original calls from citizens to the Sheriff's Office Communication Center, coupled with radio traffic and in-car camera video of the incident. We will start by providing you with some background information regarding exactly what led up to this incident. On October 6, 2019, at approximately 2.15 p.m., the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office Communication Center received a call from the 13,000 block of Bennett Road in Harold, California. The small town of Harold is a remote rural area in deep South Sacramento, east of the city of Galt. Many residences in Harold are located on multiple acres and are accessed by dirt or gravel roads. The caller indicated there was a known male at the location sitting in front of the caller's property and possibly on drugs. The caller indicated the suspect was known to carry weapons. The communication center received multiple calls from the same block regarding the same subject. The callers provided a description of the suspect as a Hispanic or black male in his 30s or 40s. Before moving forward, we will offer a word of caution. When a police officer uses force to arrest, gain control of a suspect, or defend against an attack, it can be difficult to watch. Some of the video you are about to see contains strong language in addition to graphic content which may be disturbing to sensitive viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, Sheriff's Department of Emergency. I'm um, not sure. There's a gentleman that we're, we don't know. He looks like he could be on drugs or something, but he's kind of passed out in front of our property. Okay. And apparently, they've had phone calls with this guy before, so we're very... He said he's got a gun. I guess in the past he had been carrying machetes and had a gun, shotgun next to him before, but we didn't see any. He didn't look like he had weapons, but... Okay, what's the address? Huh? What's your address? Uh, Bennett Road. What's the name of the business? There's no business. Oh, those are of our 10 acres. We live on 10 acres. But he's on our, on a part of our property, which is right at the entrance. Yeah, right in front of our house. Right. And we're very uncomfortable because we don't know what he's doing because he's just laying there. And I asked him if, you know. Yes. Here, hold on. Hello, this is the wife of who is just speaking to you. Okay, uh, um, this gentleman you guys have been called about before, his name's Angel. I don't know that he lives out here, but he stays out at one of the neighbor's house. But he's been called on because he carries a machete. He's had, had been caught with guns in his car, okay. he's patrolling, and now he's out in front of our house. I don't know if he has a weapon or not, but he didn't leave. Okay. 
Is he white, black, Asian, or Hispanic? Um, I well, with a name like Angel, I'm thinking Hispanic. He's darker skinned, all okay. complexion. How do you, how he's bald? Okay, how old do, how old do you think he is? How old did you say he is? About mid yeah, late thirties. Late thirties, early forties. It's kind of hard to tell. He's missing the two front teeth. He looks uh, weathered. Okay. Uh, do you know how tall he is, approximately? Uh, no. He was laying down, and he wouldn't. And we're like, can we help you? Nope. Just hot. And laid there. I'm okay. like, what are you doing? You live around the corner. Why are you here? Yeah, is he small, medium, or large build? Um, he's kind of chunky, isn't he? No, he's uh, medium, he, build. medium build. Okay, okay. yeah. And what is he wearing? What color he's shirt? Blue jeans and a dark blue t shirt. We don't dare go anywhere because we don't want to approach him because we know that he's been unstable in the past, and I don't really want him in front of my house because he can't leave. I don't dare it because otherwise, you know, we don't know if he'll come in and start taking stuff. Because there's also been people rifling through cars, and I don't know if that was him or not. don't want to accuse him, but we don't know. Okay, yeah. And um, what is your name? My name. Okay, and a phone number for you? Uh, okay, we'll send somebody out there, okay? Thank you so much. Do you know how long that'll be? I do not know. Uh, Let me see. Hopefully it's today. Cause All right. It, will be, it should be today. So. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Sheriff's Department. Um, yes. Uh, I'm, I live out in uh, Wilton, California, or actually Harold, California. Okay. And I live off of Bennett Road, and there's some guy down here. I don't know if he belongs here or not, but he's, like, laying on the road of our road, and I was just, I don't, I never seen him before in my life. No, when you say road, laying so. on the road, is he, like, laying in the middle of the roadway? Like, in no, the he's, like, on the, on the side of the road. Okay. Does he appear to need, like, medical help? Is he having, like, a medical emergency? I don't know. I didn't want to stop because he, I don't know, he just... Just laying there. I never seen him so before. He, so did he appear to be? So what I'm trying to figure out is, do I need to send a police to check on him, or do we need to get fire department started so they can send a medical help? Did he um, need just a, stress a or? cop to check on him? Okay, what's or correct? Or sheriff to check on him? Uh, Bennett Road. Okay, and is he on Bennett? Yeah, he's on Bennett. So you don't think he's having a medical emergency or anything? No. Okay. He's just been he's just laying there right now when I went by him. Okay. How long have you been laying there that, that you know of? Uh, I just came home from work, so I don't know. He's been laying there. I don't know how long it's been, but so how, long, been, how long has it been since you saw him? Probably five minutes ago, five ten minutes ago. Tell me about him. Was he yeah. black, white, Asian, Hispanic? Um, he looks like like dark dark skinned, maybe Mexican or black. Nearly every Sacramento County Sheriff's Office patrol vehicle is equipped with an in-car camera system. This system works in conjunction with a remote microphone, which is typically worn on the officer's duty belt. Audio is also captured on the internal microphones within the Sheriff's Department vehicle. As a note, when the in-car camera is activated on a patrol vehicle, the camera automatically backs, backs up 30, 30 seconds to show the events just prior to the activation. However, no audio is captured during that time frame, which is why you don't hear any audio in the initial portion of this video. At approximately 2.30 p.m., a sheriff's deputy arrived on the scene and attempted to make contact with the suspect, matching the description the callers provided. The suspect was lying in a ditch and appeared non-responsive upon first contact. At the time the deputy made the contact, he knew his backup was at least 15 minutes away. It is not uncommon in the rural areas of the county for a solo deputy to make contact on a call of this nature. The suspect awoke and began talking with the deputy. What are you doing past out right here? Oh, I had my rabbit. And I was looking for it, so it got hot. All right, you got some ID on you? You don't need fire or medical anything? No, 
Eight five boy, cut it one. What's your last name? Holly Maurice. Spell it. H O L L E Y. What's your first name? Maurice. M A U. M A U R I C. Good at birth, Maurice. Where are we at? We don't need to be getting up. Sit right. back down on your butt for me. Maurice, you're not listening very well. You on parole, probation, anything like that? Mm -hmm. During the conversation, the deputy observed a handgun in the suspect's waistband and immediately began giving the suspect verbal commands. Get on the fucking ground! I didn't do nothing! Give me the air, he's got a gun in his waistband. The deputy observed the suspect reach for the handgun in his waistband. Fearing he would be shot by the suspect, the deputy fired his weapon, striking the suspect. Contact. Shots fired. Code 3 cover, code 3 fire. The deputy, whose closest backup was 18 minutes away at the time the shots were fired, assessed the scene to be certain he could make a safe approach. The deputy knew he would be alone for several more minutes due to the remote and rural nature of the area. So move! The deputy approached the suspect to check his vital signs and secure him in handcuffs. Negative, I'm not hit. The deputy determined the suspect had no pulse and was not breathing. He was deceased. 8-5 boy, suspect's cuff. Go ahead and resume. Incoming units are probably better off taking uh, Grant Line to Wilton Road, then take Diller to PlayStation, come down that way. Upon closer observation of the gun brandished by the suspect, the deputy realized it was not a real firearm. No, they can reduce. Continue. Fuck! Speedy gun! The handgun seen by the deputy in the suspect's waistband was determined to be a Glock-style airsoft gun as seen in this photo. A subsequent search of the suspect's body revealed an additional airsoft gun in his waistband seen in this photo. The suspect, identified as 55-year-old Maurice Fernander Hawley, was declared deceased at the scene. What the deputy didn't know at the time of contact was that Maurice Hawley had two outstanding misdemeanor warrants and a criminal history in at least four states, including two states where he served state prison time. We hope this video provided you some insight into the complexities of policing and some of the situations sheriff's deputies encounter while keeping our community safe. For more information about the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office, please visit our website at www.sacsheriff.com. On behalf of the men and women of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office, thank you for watching. All right, let's get into it. Drop the volume.
acres. In our so we can tell that we're dealing with a very, very rural area. <clears throat> and very, very wide open space. Um, like when you say country, like this is country. <laughs> like out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, this is, you know, this might be something that people don't fully realize who may live in more urbanized areas, but there are, there are some law enforcement officers out there who their agency is, you know, their budget's small, so they have a small roster, and there could be no more than five people working an entire county at night. There could just be maybe two or three deputies working an entire county. Um, there are some sheriff's offices across the nation that they basically shut down in the afternoon at normal business hours, and they don't have anybody out at nighttime. The state police or highway patrol kind of take over those responsibilities and, and whatnot during those nighttime hours. And um, the locations out here in the in the country, the county, backup is can be, in this case, about 18 minutes out. There's sometimes where backup is 30 minutes away, almost an hour away. I just don't think that's something that people fully realize, uh, that that's what some law enforcement in this country have to deal with is they're out in the middle of nowhere and there's no one there to back them up at least for almost half an hour and that's the case that this deputy's in um he is way out in the middle of nowhere and comes across this guy who which is interesting it makes me wonder how the hell did this dude get all the way out in the middle of nowhere like is he walking this far out? I mean, we see the aerial right here. Um, Sacramento, east of the city of Galt. I mean, there's some built-up stuff around here. Maybe it looks mostly like road. I would have to really open up my own Google map. and The remote rural area in deep south Sacramento, east of the city. Yeah, there. I mean, it's just it just looks like houses and stuff out here. Like, make, it makes me wonder, like, how in the hell did City this dude get all Many the way out there? Are located on multiple acres, but and accessed by somehow he did, roads. and he found himself all, all the way out in the middle of nowhere. Nature. The suspect awoke and began talking with the deputy. Now it's possible that. Uh, you know, he was with some people late at night, um, and there's kind of a, maybe a drug house out here somewhere that they do stuff at. Maybe, you know, he was up to no good in this area. Uh, the 911 call kind of indicated um, that these people had, have dealt with this guy before. 2019. Number 6, 2019, Deep South Sacramento. Moving forward, we will offer a word of caution. Okay. Apparently, they've had phone calls with this guy before, so we're very... He said he couldn't go. Yeah, okay. well, had, I guess in the past, he had been carrying machetes and had a gun. So they've dealt with him before in the past. It doesn't really um, go into detail about how long this has been going on. So it's anyone's guess at this point how this guy got out here so far out. But uh, he's out here. Deputy makes the approach, talks to him. The guy says something crazy about a rabbit. Woke and began talking with the deputy. What are you doing passed out right here? Oh, I had my rabbit. And... <laughs> had your rabbit, huh? So it's obvious this guy is either A, on drugs, or B, there's some type of mental problem with this guy. That could be a little bit of both. 
But keep in mind, this guy has two airsoft guns in his waistband at this moment. Maurice, you're not listening very well. You on parole, probation, anything like that? During the conversation, the deputy observed a handgun in the suspect's waistband and immediately began giving the suspect verbal commands. Get on the fucking ground! I didn't do nothing! Give me the air, he's got a gun in his waistband. The deputy observed the suspect reach for the handgun in his waistband. Fearing he would be shot by the suspect, the deputy fired his weapon, striking the suspect. Contact! Shots fired. Code 3 cover, code 3 fire. The deputy, whose closest backup was 18 minutes away at the time the shots were fired, assessed the scene to be certain he could make a safe approach. The deputy knew he would be alone for several more minutes due to the remote and rural nature of the area. So move! The deputy approached the suspect to check his vital signs and secure him in handcuffs. Negative, I'm not hit. The deputy determined the suspect had no pulse and was not breathing. He was deceased. Eight, five, four. Nope. Let's go back into the shooting part. And we're safe of 18. Aired his weapon. Fearing he would be shot by the suspect. So the camera doesn't uh, give very, very clear um, images. It's, it's kind of blurry looking. So. <clears throat> The human eye obviously would not be blurry like that uh, with the distance between him and the guy. He's going, going to be able to see, excuse me, he's going to be able to see a lot better with a lot more clarity than what we are able to look at and see. But he can see that waistband. He can see that gun. And the hand, the suspect's hand goes towards it. The deputy observed. Give me the air. He's got a gun in his waistband. So the deputy says he's got a gun in his waistband out loud. Obviously, this guy can hear that. And he automatically reaches down to his waistband with his hand. Deputy observed the suspect reach for the handgun in his waistband. Fearing he would be shot by the suspect, the deputy fired his weapon, striking the suspect. Shots fired. Code 3 cover, code 3 fire. The deputy, whose closest backup was 18 minutes away at the time the shots were fired, assessed the scene to be certain he could make a safe approach. The deputy knew he would be alone for several more minutes due to the remote and rural nature of the area. So that is something that I like right there. He expended some rounds out of his gun. He doesn't know if he's going to have to fight some more. And he does a, a tactical reload. He drops the magazine and he puts a new one in. Yeah. Don't move. That way, if he has to fight some more, he has a fresh mag in the gun ready to go. The deputy approached the suspect to check his vital signs and secure him in handcuffs. Negative, I'm not hit.
The deputy determined the suspect had no pulse and was not breathing. He was deceased. Eight five boy, suspect's cuff. Go ahead and resume. Now, the only, and it's not this big of a deal, but once he secures them and he starts going back, you know, he could have retrieved that magazine that still had some rounds left in it and put it back in his magazine pouch. And it looked like he had a magazine pouch in the horizontal um, configuration. So uh, if you wanted to, um, you know, if he, if he is the type to always go to the top pouch of the magazine pouch, then he could have taken the bottom magazine out, put it on that top pouch, and then put the somewhat depleted magazine in that bottom pouch. And, you know, if you get the vertical pouch, uh, you know, the magazine closest to the belt buckle, um, you know, for me personally, when I go to it, um, that's the first one I go to is the, the slot closest to the belt. And anytime, you know, doing firearms training, and uh, go to retrieve a mag, I'll take the mag out of the second spot furthest away from the buckle, move it forward into that empty spot closest to the buckle, and then fill that last uh, magazine pouch spot with the magazine that's had some rounds depleted from it. That way, um, if I need to fight some more uh, or shoot some more, then, and if I go to slide lock, you know, with that already initial reloaded mag, then um, um, I can go to that fresh mag, the, you know, realistically the, the last fresh mag there is. Um, and if bad shit happens and you go all the way through that mag, then that last mag that has already had some rounds depleted in it, uh, you can still get that one and, and put it into use. And then obviously past that point, um, either A, you're going to be doing the Nike drill and getting the hell out of there, or um, going to your backup, but you know that kind of stuff's a little a little unrealistic. Uh, I'm not saying it's totally uh, impossible to happen. Um, I mean, there have been cases where people have emptied all their magazines in a fight, but uh, that's that's very rare that that happens. Um, normally, it's just you expend a few rounds from one magazine and that's it. But just for for a good practice, I guess you could say. I practice and I train to pick up that expended mag. Um, now, if it's completely empty, I'm not worrying about it. But if it's still got some rounds in it, uh, I'll take that partially depleted mag and I'll put it back in my magazine pouch. Or, you know, if I've got um, cargo pants, I can even throw it down in the cargo pocket or something like that. That way I'm at least still retaining a magazine with some partial rounds in it. Uh, he cuffs them. And that's a pretty standard tactic after a shooting. Um, the FBI, back in the 80s, got into a gunfight with some bank robbers. And one of the bank robbers uh, took a round to the head and went unconscious during the beginning phase of this gunfight and then woke back up later and got back in the fight. Uh, the other guy, he was shot multiple times and uh, still stayed in the fight. There's been other cases where things like that have happened, but the, the Miami um, shootout with the FBI is kind of the more famous one that is referenced referenced a lot in training. But it's happened a lot all across the nation, all across the world. When you're dealing with pistol caliber ammunition, um, sometimes people get back up after you've shot them a few times. Even if you've shot them in the head, there have been people who've gotten back up and got back in the fight. So it's pretty common practice after someone's been shot to go ahead and cuff them up. That way, if they wake back up and decide to start fighting some more, they're going to be pretty limited in how effectively they get the fight because their hands are cut behind their back. Well, so good on that. I like, you know, I like seeing the cuffing after shooting. Negative, I'm not hit. Now, 
<clears throat> I, I know that he wanted to cuff him uh, as quick as possible. Um, And for for him, it could have been the decision to once he got that close. The deputy approached the suspect to check his vital signs and secure him in handcuffs. Now, for him, this might have been the safest option for him to go ahead and get control over that uh, limb, holster up, and then start to uh, cuff him. Uh, I would like to see gloves put on before touching someone who's got blood all over them. Because you never know what someone's got. And you have to assume that everyone has something. Some type of bloodborne pathogen that's going to be um, deadly or life-altering. So always glove up before touching people with blood. Now, can you do that every single time? No. Sometimes you have to go hands-on uh, without taking the time to put the gloves on. Is this one of those times? It's hard to say. Um, we can't see a whole lot from this camera view. Um, he's a lot closer. He can see with his human eye. He can see better than we can. And in that situation, he may have felt that it was safer for him to go ahead and gain control of this guy with bare hands versus taking the time to try and put the gloves on. Negative, I'm not hit. The deputy determined the suspect had no pulse and was not breathing. He was deceased. Hey, bye, boy. Suspect's cuff. Go ahead and resolve. Now, he did get a little bit of blood on him. Um, I am a fan of the belief that if you're touching someone and you've got their blood on you, just wipe your hands on them. It's their blood. They've already got blood on their clothes. What's it matter if you wipe your hands on their leg where there's no blood there at all? You can wipe your hands off on someone. Use them as a, as a towel if you need to. Uh, Grant line to Wilton Then the sudden realization that um, the guy had to be begun. Now, <clears throat> if no one had said anything about this being a BB gun, would you, at a quick glance looking at this, would you have? assumed that this was a real gun or a BB gun. There is no distinctive orange tip at the end, as is common with most airsoft pistols. With the lack of any orange tip at the end right here, and just doing a, a quick glance, this thing looks totally real. Even the end right here, I mean, you can't see the diameter very well this could very well you know be something like a 22 pistol just looking at it and seeing this in the heat of the moment there's no way anyone could ever say oh that's that's just a bb gun this thing looks completely Same real a subsequent search of the suspect's body revealed an additional airsoft even this, I mean, obviously you don't get to see the end of the gun, um, but who knows if there was a uh, orange tip at the end to clearly show that it was an airsoft gun. I mean, there's just there's just no way of knowing uh, that this is real or fake, and especially in the heat of the moment when 
a split in his waistband. second See decision has to be made. And when you're dealing in dynamic situations, deadly physical force, dynamic situations, action generally beats reaction, right? So uh, you ever play the hand slap game where uh, you got both your hands extended out, palms um, facing down, and the other person have their hands extended out and their palms are, are facing up to, towards your palms, and they will unannounced move their hands really quick out from under yours and slap the top of your hands, and your objective is to rip your hands backwards before they can slap your hands. More often than not, they're going to slap your hands before you can jerk your hands back to avoid being hit. And when this guy made this quick furtive movement with his hand towards what looked like to be a real gun, there's no way the officer could ever be expected to wait to see if that guy is going to pull that thing out and, and start shooting at him or pull it out and very quickly toss it to the side. There's just, there's just no realistic expectation for that. Like, if this gun was real and he reached for his waistband, he grabbed it, he pulled it out. With action, most of the time being able to beat reaction, he could have actually fired rounds at that deputy before that deputy could have put effective incapacitating rounds on him. And if he got a lucky one round hit by doing a quick draw and hit the deputy in the face, it's game over. So you just, you cannot wait to see what the person's going to do, but you just can't, you, you'll die. So when this guy made that quick movement with his hand after being told, don't touch the gun, both his hands are extended away from his body. Deputy says, don't touch that gun. And then he immediately reaches down for where that gun is. That deputy believed that that guy was reaching for his gun. I believed that the guy was reaching for his gun. Any person with a reasonable mind would believe this guy was reaching for his gun. Now, no one but the suspect knew that it's a fake gun. So why in the hell did he reach for a BB gun, knowing the cop is, is more than likely not carrying a BB gun? Who knows? Maybe the guy was going to pull it out and say, hey, it's fake. It's not real. Maybe he was going to just pluck it out of his waistband and drop it on the ground for the officer. Who knows? Uh, maybe he was going to pull it out, pull it out of his waistband and point it at the officer and think that he could force the officer to, to get back and leave him alone. I, it's anyone's guess what this guy's intentions were by reaching for his fake gun. But in that moment, the only people who knew that gun was fake was the suspect. And why was he carrying two BB guns on him? That's, again, is anyone's guess. I mean, it, it's possible that this guy is transient. Um, I mean, he it, it doesn't look like he has a very stable life. And so I'd assume that maybe he doesn't have um, a stable home or anything like that. And it's possible that he had these BB guns to protect himself from other transient people who are um, looking to steal and rob. That's kind of the... Something that's not really spoken about a whole lot with homeless people, because a lot of people just kind of ignore the homeless population and, and you know don't want much to do with them. But the homeless population... Some of them can be pretty violent, and they'll rob each other uh, for what little stuff each other have. Um, so he could have had those to kind of protect himself from some of those other predators. Uh, he could have had them to to victimize people. He could have been using those to, to rob people. 
and take things from him and then believing he had a real gun. Uh, he could have just stolen those things and was hanging on to them to be able to go sell them to, you know, make money off of them. Who knows? Who knows why he had them? But uh, he had them. They looked completely real. Uh, obviously, only one of them was seen by the deputy, and it looked completely real enough to, to cause him to have to use deadly physical force because he thought this guy was going for the gun and was going to kill him. Um... I did a search, and the Sacramento District Attorney's Office cleared the deputy. Um, no charges brought against him. And then I saw that as of, let me bring it back up. Looking at my phone, and sometimes it takes a second. Um, this, of course, this incident occurred in 2019, October 2019, and as of February 25th, 2021, uh, the woman is suing the Sacramento, his wife, his widow, is suing the Sacramento Sheriff's Office. Um, open this up. The lawsuit disputes that cl claiming video shows Holly attempting to make himself more comfortable while sitting on the ground and was not reaching for anything. Well, that's bullshit. I mean, we could see plainly that he reached for his waistband. He reached towards that gun. Holly's widow, Kimberly Perez, is seeking damages from the department. Well, of course she is. Deputies were called to Bennett Road... Okay, we already heard this. The lawsuit claims Holly was asleep on the side of the road and presented no apparent threat or harm to the deputy. The lawsuit alleges that deputies did not call for medical care or allow medical personnel to treat Holly in a timely manner after he was shot. That alleged delay of medical caused Holly extreme physical and emotional pain and suffering and was a contributing cause of Holly's serious injuries. Holly's three children are also named as nominal defendants in the suit and could be added as plaintiffs later if they choose. So, kind of sounds like ghetto lottery to me. Um, of course, anyone's going to sue for anything if they think they got a chance and uh, these people think they have a chance, and it's that sucks too because there are some governmental entities or the people who are elected officials who are in charge of these governmental entities. They're so lame, fence-riding pansies that they would rather have their insurance give a settlement uh, rather than take it to trial. And that happens all across the U.S. Um, bigger cities, you know, the, the elected officials, they don't want to mess with it. They want it to go away. And these cities, they'll settle lawsuits. They'll give a settlement uh, just to avoid taking things to trial. And I, I don't know the full uh, details of the lawsuit, you know, that was initiated in February of this year. And where it's at right now. But, I mean, it's it's obviously clear that uh, this guy reached for his waistband and the gun looked completely real. Um, even with the photograph showing it up close, it still looks completely real. Uh, I, me, personally, I don't think that they have a leg to stand on with this lawsuit. Um, I, I mean, maybe, maybe they could have something to, to stand on in terms of him not providing medical care. Uh, but we don't get to see the rest of the video, so I can't really comment on that because, I mean, we don't get to see it. Um, you know, this guy might be tra trained in first aid only. Um, and when it comes to first aid training, you know, there is writing within the curriculum that says, you know, don't give CPR and signs of obvious death. This deputy 
um, who could see a lot more than what we can see. And based off his experience with seeing normal, um, or not normal, but with his experience of seeing uh, similar uh, wounds and injuries, and based on where these gunshots were, uh, he may have had the belief that this was a case of very obvious death, and that there's no there's no amount of CPR or first aid that would be able to bring this guy back. So he may have had that belief and opted out, and and even wasting his time in trying to provide medical care. I mean, if you can see brain matter coming out the head that's a pretty good indication of, of obvious death and that would be a an indication you know don't waste your time on it but uh of course we don't get to see those kind of details just from this dash cam so i mean that's just obviously uh pure speculation um so speaking of medical uh obviously you know if you're going to be carrying a gun uh, you have the means to induce trauma, so that means you should have the means to reduce trauma. Uh, if you're able to give medical care and you feel that it's safe to do so and that you should be giving medical care, then go ahead and give medical care. Um, I think it's always best to have medical gear on you, especially in armed, uniformed work like this. Uh, whether you're police or security, you should have some type of medical kit on you to deal with gunshot wounds or stab wounds. Some type of traumatic puncturing or uh, lacerating type of injury. So, you know, that could be in the form of what's called a blowout kit or ventilated operator kit or IFAC, some whatever kind of terminology you want to assign to it it needs to have needs to have something like a tourniquet something to deal with extreme hemorrhaging of an extremity um the ability to uh, maintain an airway something like a nasopharyngeal airway something like that um some gauze to um, pack a wound with or to start wrapping around a wound and be able to deal with those uh, kind of injuries. And you can have something very minimal on your person that doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Uh, you know, if you work uniform and you have an ankle gun as a backup on your ankle, then your other ankle could very well carry a medical kit inside of an ankle medical holster. I have a video on that. Look through here, find it, watch it. Um, if not, Google medical ankle holsters. Um, and you can get an idea of how much stuff you can carry on you. Now that stuff I recommend is only for you, your partners, and or your family if you're an armed citizen carrying carrying that kind of stuff. Um, only when it's secure and safe to do so should you use that first line gear intended for yourself or your partners and family on other people. You know, if there's the possibility that more fighting could happen, then don't waste your good stuff on bad people. Um, you know, let's use this for example. Let's say he had one tourniquet on his body. He didn't have any more in his car and this guy wasn't immediately dead. Um, and he put that tourniquet on this guy's arm and then his widow came around the corner uh, somewhere down the road, started shooting the deputy and shot the deputy in the leg. And now he's got a femoral injury. You know, once he dealt with her, He's got a femoral hit. He needs a tourniquet. What's he going to do? Is he going to go to the bad guy and take the tourniquet off him and put it on him? <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's an option. <laughs> but um, is it a good option? So only if it's... Only if you feel it is perfectly safe to do so and there's no other threat of injuries coming to you should you use your first line medical gear on anyone else other than a partner or a loved one bad guys if they can wait if you don't feel it's safe enough to use your first line gear now if you got extra gear that's in the car then obviously by all means go use that stuff but the stuff that's on your body that's intended for you in case you get hit or your partners or your loved ones don't use it unless you feel that you're absolutely sure there's no more fighting to be done. Because if you put that tourniquet on someone um, and it's all covered in blood and everything, then you get hit and you need a tourniquet. 
well, what are you going to do? You're going to take the tourniquet off them and put it on and get their blood or then your wound and then um, deal with all that? No. I mean, just keep your first line medical stuff for you, your partners and your loved ones, bad guys, and everyone else get all the extra stuff that you have crammed in your car. Um, as far as medical stuff in your car, so, you know, first line medical gear should be something minimal, uh, to deal with the immediate, you know, extreme hemorrhaging or something like that of an extremity. Um, and of course, you know, airway and, and the gauze to help, you know, stop the bleeding. Um, on top of that, you should have, um, follow on support medical gear in your vehicle, um, something to supplement what you've got on your person. And that could be in the form of a dedicated trauma bag or more of a modified trauma bag. You know, if you've got an agency that has a bunch of this stuff and you can just kind of mix and match, then by all means, you know, mix and match and, and make your own stuff. Uh, if you if you get a trauma kit from your agency or your company, uh, check it out, see what's in it. And if you feel like you should add to it, then add to it. Uh, if you work the road and um, the ambulance crews that you you deal with are the same people over and over most of the time, uh, obviously, you know, you all are going to build some kind of relationship. You're going to know each other. Um, ask them for some extra stuff off the truck. You know, next time you're at a scene of a car wreck or something like that, um, and, you know, obviously nothing's too pertinent going on um, or you get there and, you you know, you're dealing with, you know, some overdose person or some other medical thing that's not, you know, really emergent. You know, you're chit-chatting with the EMS people. Ask them if they got an extra bag valve mask that you could add to your medical kit. A lot of these places, you know, the ambulance crews, they don't buy that stuff. The, the hospital has it and they'll, they can spare stuff no problem. I mean... All they do is give you a give you a bag bag valve mask, and then when they get back to their station, they can go back to their supply closet that has hundreds of these things, and just throw it back on the truck. Ask them for some four by fours, um, some gauze and wraps and stuff like that. Like you can just ask for little stuff here and there, and you can just add that stuff into your existing trauma kit and have a pretty good stocked trauma kit. You just piece it together over time. Um, as far as, you know, your, your company, or your agency not providing anything at all, uh, that sucks, but that's a reality for a lot of places. Um, first things first is you and your partners and or loved ones. So you should definitely, um, pay out of pocket to get life-saving equipment for yourself or your partners. Uh, if, if your agency or your company doesn't provide a tourniquet, then you need to go buy a tourniquet on your own. Yeah, I know things aren't cheap, but uh, you know maybe you could skip a few meals eating out, eat at home, and uh, you know instead of eating out when you go to work for a week, maybe spend a week or two bringing some ham sandwiches to work so you can save some money and buy some needed life-saving equipment. That's about it on what I need to talk about in regards to this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.